Hey everyone, welcome to Music in the Metaverse. With uh, We're going to be interviewing Jonathan Gray today. I'm your host from Inside.com, Stephanie Zielinski, and we are so excited in a moment to be joined with uh, the serial entrepreneur and founder and CEO of Encore, Jonathan Gray. Um, Encore is an interactive live music app where artists perform in an augmented reality environment. I cannot wait for this conversation. It's going to be so interesting. Um, but before we dive into it, I want to tell you just a little more about Inside.com. Our mission at Inside is to help entrepreneurs and executives level up their knowledge and careers. We do this by providing news, networking, community, events. We've got 14 different newsletters with almost a half million active subscribers. They cover the worlds of business, tech, venture capital, crypto, and of course, XR, um, and a lot more. We host free events like this one every month where uh, anyone can hear from the people who are building the worlds of tomorrow and discover exclusive insights and trends from industry experts. So later on in this interview, we'll bring on the editor, the writer of the XR newsletter, Gia Matu, and she's going to uh, discuss some really technical aspects of XR and Encore with Jonathan. Um, in the spirit of community, please go to the comments section and tell us where you are tuning in from. Tell us who you are, what you do. If you're in the XR space, maybe you're in the music industry. Let us know. We're uh, on YouTube and Twitter and Zoom and all over the place. So say hi in the comments, please. And of course, if you have questions for Jonathan, you can put those in the comments too. At the end of our time, we will um, give him some of your questions. So without further ado, let's get into it. I want to welcome Jonathan on and say thanks for joining us, Jonathan. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Of course. Encore is such a cool app. It seems like there is great community there. Um, I was really sad to hear about the passing of one of Encore's young artists recently, Sad Frosty. I'm sure he was a big part of that community. Um, would you like to tell us a little about the community that's been built at Encore? For sure. Yeah. Um, we're a local LA based company and, you know, something in the music industry that's really um, interesting is just how networked and tight knit communities of artists are. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually never had a chance to work with Sad Frosty. We've covered events that he was at. Um, one of our, he was scheduled to do a show in February and mm -hmm. um, really, really sad, unfortunate passing um recently of him and it's hit the whole community really hard because it's just so tight-knit and you know everyone is fighting to have a career and make it in a really tough competitive industry and so I think that creates a lot of very very tight bonds and um really sad to see his his passing and um wish the best for him and his fans and and all of his friends yeah, and, I feel like uh, moments yeah. like this also like cause everyone to stop and reflect and be grateful, like a celebration of the work that they've done. You know, today's Mac sure. Miller's birthday and he just lives on through his music. And I know uh, Sad Frosty will do the same. Um, there's For a sure. huge music name in Encore. Your uh, chief creative officer is Kid Cudi. How did you guys connect that small community, right? Yeah, so um, there's three founders. It's me, um, Cuddy, and Ian Edelman. And Ian Edelman is the connector of me and Cuddy. So, oh, really? Um, yeah, I met Ian three years ago um, through uh, a mutual friend, and we started working together. And then when he and I started to um, come together to start Encore, he was actually in the middle of a movie production with Cuddy. And Ian and Cuddy Wait, um, have... Uh, a forthcoming movie uh, coming oh. out later this year, and How cool. um, and then uh, Ian created a show called How to Make It in America on HBO. Um, Cuddy was in that show. That was his mm. one of his big first acting uh, debuts, and so Ian and Cuddy have been longtime collaborators, and we're in the midst of a movie um, right when we got Encore off the ground, and that's how we got him involved with the project and he's actually one of our co-founders um and you know a big part of of what we're doing here and an interesting thing about Cuddy is he was discovered on myspace so uh you know he's one of that. the biggest earliest artists to 
And there was a really cool documentary that came out um, about him on Amazon. Um, mm -hmm. They go all into the whole story and all this kinds of stuff. And it's just really funny because there's a radio interview and there's like, so let me get this straight. You were discovered on the internet. You uploaded your music <laughs> to but the internet. But wasn't that like early 2000s? Yeah. I mean, this is like it's 2008 or something like that. Yeah. You know, not even that early. And things right, changed right. so, so fast, so fast. <laughs> And now it's obviously the only way to be discovered is on the internet in anything. And, um, but, you know, a lot of why he got involved is there is no MySpace and there isn't really a home for music on the internet anymore. And the streaming services have kind of, you know, become the, the centerpiece of the music industry. Mm -hmm. But where is an artist's homepage? Where do fan communities live? And MySpace, when MySpace was lost, a lot was really lost. And now, you know, I always say you can be a dog walker or a global world, you know, Grammy winning artist and Instagram is your homepage. And, you know, that's something <laughs> right, that, right, that, that's that, weird. that Encore wants to, to help is to actually create something that's really for artists and for music fans um, that can be their place on the Internet. Yeah, because MySpace was so interactive and Encore's really trying to have that like personal engagement between artists and fans. Exactly. And so, you know, we'll try to bring back some of the old classics, you know, like you used to have your top <laughs> eight. It's like, yeah, you used to be able to go to see someone's profile and like who are their favorite musicians and you could go to an artist page and who are their favorite artists and discover music. And it was a place for discovering artists, music, friends and all that kind of stuff. And I think... Um, that's been lost on a lot of these very generic um, social media platforms. And so yeah. we're not gonna be you know, a new Instagram. Instagram is what it is. And these big social networks are great for what they are, but Instagram is not where you're gonna see an amazing live performance from your favorite artist at all. And- Yeah, it's a blanket platform. And the other challenge is, you know, largely artists just give away their creativity, talent, and art for free all day on those platforms. Um, they're not really oriented around monetization and giving them a career and a way to actually make money. Um, and so mostly, you know, social media serves as a way for artists to try to find a following to hope to go and catch some streams on Spotify and Apple Music. Mm -hmm. And the payout rates on streaming platforms are really low per stream. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have millions of streams, you don't have a full-time job and you have side hustles or you have another full-time job. And so, you know, the music industry is filled with artists who have fans, but aren't Drake. And that those artists struggle to have a living from streams. And, you know, what we see is an incredible opportunity to bring fans and artists much closer together and in a direct way um to lean into what artists are great at like performing live but to yeah. make it as easy and as accessible for both and so you don't have to do a concert if you have an iphone at your house and you're a music artist and you have creativity through ar and through you know the camera and everything that's you know available inside of these portable computers um you can actually create some really professional high-end production wow and okay so there you're like creating this niche app, which, you know, I've, I've learned so much about Encore recently, but I'm really seeing it now as like a new MySpace. And it's so interesting that we're in this era now where there's like an old internet nostalgia that can come forward. Like you talking about the top eight and like right. bringing these <laughs> things into a new app. That's really interesting. And you're also talking about like monetization. Can you like elaborate on the revenue strategy here with Encore? Because that is super unique to this app. Yeah, so we have a virtual currency that are claps and every clap costs 10 cents. And so, you know, the 10 cent clap for us has been a really important part of how the app works in that every show requires a fan to clap. And so on one hand, everything's monetized. And so artists are being paid for their art. At the same time, 10 cents is a very low price. And, you know, we call it free adjacent and allows fans to see a show from an artist they've never heard of, to still discover stuff. But at the same time, 
10 cents per clap per fan is like a hundred times more than what you would make per view on a streaming platform or on YouTube or on any of those other kinds of platforms, or you'd be making nothing with that content on social media. And so yeah. we think 10 cents a clap can actually change the world. And the way that it kind of works once you're in those shows is it's a gamified interactive experience. And so the fans who clap the most are at the top of the leaderboard. The artist sees them at the top of the leaderboard and gives them shout outs. You can do interactive polling. And so I can clap to vote a really common flow for, for how songs work is like artists are like, what song should I do next? And they'll huh. put up, you know, their, their three different songs and fans are all Probably. clapping. <laughs> They're all clapping, uh, you know, to vote for which thing they want to see. And then at the end of every show, we have a feature called Backstage Pass where the top three clappers have this one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with the artists that all the fans watch. And so it's like this really, really cool moment that happens at the end of the shows where the top fans kind of get rewarded with, you know, the recognition and the FaceTime with the artist. Um, but it's really, really fun because the artist is kind of just getting off stage, right? They just did their thing. They're all warmed up and like in their mode, the fans just got done watching and experiencing like one of their favorite artists doing this live performance. And so it's just all smiles and happiness and mm -hmm. you know, these really, really Bye. cool kind of fan um, moments. So that's like a super engaging part of the app is, is that one-on-one -on -one FaceTime. Is there anything else that's um, like really, that, that's in the app that's really driving engagement? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty much that. And part of the magic of the app is that the shows are short. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we really think of ourselves very separate from live music, kind of traditional live music or what mm -hmm. I think of as concerts on computers, right? So there's a lot of live streaming, live music streaming stuff happening in the world. Most of that are hour long, 90 minute stage shows, full on traditional lighting, fog, sparks, all this kinds of stuff, professional cameras, edited, multicam, Right. And then sold right. pay-per-view for $20 or something like that um, through your web browser. We're not doing anything like that. Our shows are 10 cents and they start at one song. And so what's great about our shows is that, you know, you might just be like on the bus or you might be at a break at, at work or you might be driving somewhere and you could watch a show. The shows are anywhere from like, three minutes to 15 minutes. Sometimes they're longer, but usually they're not. And so they're bite-sized. And so they're these really easy to um, participate in and really easy to watch. They don't require you to like block out time in your calendars. They don't require you to set a bunch of reminders. You know, you'll get, you're gonna get right. push notification notifications right before the show, hit it, pop open, things are live, you're watching it, it's over in 10 minutes. It's like a bag of chips. <laughs> um, really fun, really high energy, really engaging, great experiences that you have, but don't necessarily require you to commit your day or afternoon to it. Yeah, totally. So do you see uh, the music industry going this way? I mean, when the pandemic hit almost two years ago, the live music industry changed a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm, I know it can go in a lot of different directions. I'm curious your like predictions there. Most artists can't tour. You gotta be pretty big to be able to tour. Mm -hmm. Most artists can't sell merch. Most artists can't do, you know, music artists, when they have successful careers, they're not making money one way, they're making it five ways. And that's how they make a successful yeah. career. And I think that, you know, what we're gonna see is more of that, but through digital means, it can be way, made way more accessible, right? So if, if the only kind of concerts I can do require me to have a physical venue and sell physical tickets at a time, I gotta be able to fill 500 seats, 200, whatever it is in multiple cities before I can even tour, right? Mm -hmm. With us, it's like, okay, if you, if you have a phone and you have your own music, you can start doing shows tomorrow. And so I think one of the things that you're gonna see with technology and where we see the future going is just creating a lot more access to a much larger percentage of artists. And you know, this was something part of the interesting basis in, of the company, yeah, right? You're talking about access, democratization. Exactly. You know, we 
really kind of started the company and went gung ho on the AR side because we really look at AR as a huge democratizing technology. Um, you know, we also are experimenting with things outside of music. So we have um, some people who are going to be doing podcasts and they're going to be doing live video podcasts using AR mm-hmm. in our app. We have yeah, why not like, use someone on who's a that. stand-up comedian, right? So it's like anything that is live performance, anything that is live video like that, what does AR do? AR allows you to actually have really cool production and creative execution with no budget. With, you know, nothing but your room. it's all in the app. Yeah, because cause everything Encore is, digital, is providing that. Mm-hmm. Everything is software. And so, um, you know, it's it's crazy how analog so much is still in the music industry. Yeah, right? I'm starting to realize that as I see how specific Encore is, like exactly what you guys do. A music video? What is a music video, right? Go on site somewhere. Analog. Film crew, yeah. lighting, post-production, multiple takes, all of those kinds of stuff. A day or two, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars. It's all to make a yeah. music video, right? If you think about I mean, live it looks shows, pretty. yeah. Live shows require lighting design, choreographing, glam squads. It's a huge deal, and all of those, like the level of production required to do any of those things, creates a huge barrier. And I'd say one of the things that's been really interesting for us uh, as we've gone about this and worked with a lot of artists is it's easy to understand how a smaller artist doesn't have access to those things. Right. One thing we've really learned is that even bigger artists, even if they can theoretically do all of those things, those things aren't repeatable. So if a music video costs me $100,000 in two to three days, how many music videos am I actually going to make? If doing the concert requires six months of planning, bunch of budget going into my lighting design and all of the choreography and everything around all of this stuff, like how many times can I do that show, right? How many times can I virtually stream that massive, huge production that I make? Mm-hmm. And so even for big artists, those aren't repeatable. They're not scalable. And, you know, we've had this really cool partnership with Too Short. Um, you know, legacy artists been around forever, 30 years in the game and, you know, has whatever budget he wants to do whatever the things that is that he wants to do. And he's got a new album coming out this year. He's doing two traditional music videos, but he's doing four music videos using Encore, right? Eventually he'll probably tour, but right now, every time he drops one of his new singles, he does a live show of that single on Encore. Mm-hmm. So even for a really big artist who can perform on big stages, who is going to still make traditional music videos, okay, well, am I making one or two music videos per album? Or could I have a music video for every song on my album? Right? Am That's I going to do fun one more fun and exciting tour? for the fans? Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, you know, for us, a lot of it is to the artist is um, it's not even like spend more time on your phone, it's spend less time on social media, doing things for free and more time doing things, doing things that are more artistic and creative and about music and that ultimately going to be monetized. Um, yeah. And so that's the thing is like, you know, we want to also not just be a way to make money. We want to be more fun because what mm-hmm. you're doing for us is not about necessarily like going viral and memes and seeing what the popular trends are on TikTok, it's about being an artist. It's about, you know, it's performing. doing what's, yeah. what's doing true to you. And then, yeah, a lot of them, their superpower is performing. Their superpower is engaging with fans and um, creating the right venue for that to exist is what we're after. And, uh, and now they call out the metaverse. Yes. Okay. So music in the metaverse, Encore is a part of the metaverse. I'm seeing this distinction between um, smaller artists and bigger artists, like, uh, you know, artists that maybe have a small following that are performing on Encore. They're doing a metaverse performance Um, and Encore is still a startup. There's also really big companies like Roblox and Fortnite that are hosting these big artists like Ariana Grande for music concerts in the metaverse. So how are you seeing uh, startups like Encore doing something more nimble and different and interesting? Like, how are they different than these big companies with with deep pockets? 
Yeah. So I think if you look at some of the really cool and exciting live music executions like Fortnite and Roblox and those types of things, those are million dollar productions. There's they still are. teams teams of CGI um, the suit. designers. Mm -hmm. There's they're amazing, right? But basically what we're witnessing is like, here's all of the people who are the best in the world at what it is that they're doing, defining what the future is going to be and how it's gonna look and oh. those things, which is awesome. But like, how many Ariana Grandes are there? <laughs> and then how many are there who are trying to become an Ariana Grande, but actually have thousands of legitimate real fans and are putting out yeah. music all of the time. And you know, that's the thing in music. There's this huge group of people who haven't made this huge breakout, but have real fans, make real music, are doing real things, and they don't have any access to any of that stuff. And yeah, so that's why we look at mobile tech and AR as these massive democratizing technologies that without them, it really is hard to do all of that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But with them, it's just getting easier and easier. And I think, you know, those platforms will become easier and they will not always require, you know, as much stuff. But, um, right. you know, I think it's part of the way that we've always looked at what we're doing as a company is it's not just a platform for artists, it's a tool. Yeah. Our, our goal yeah, can't just be to like have the place and then expect everyone to come to it and do all of the work and everything else. It's like artists need help. It and does work for you, and with you. How, how can we give not just a place, but a tool, something that's functional, something that really provides um, a new way to do what you want to do that didn't exist before this. That's so awesome. Um, I still have so many more questions, but before I dive into those, I want to invite on inside.com's XR expert. Um, and she's got more like specific questions about the app and XR and how it all, how it all works. So, um, cool. welcome Gia. Hi, Jonathan. Nice to Hi, see Gia. you again. I love nice what you, you. I love what you and Encore is building. Um, I'm very excited about the platform. And I did want to mention something about the, you know, the metaverse platform. What I really like about your app and I've used it myself is that it's authentic. Like, you know, you have the Roblox metaverse, you know, performances, but they're avatars, right? If I'm a fan of my artists, I actually want to see my artists. And one thing, another thing that really stands out for me is the fact that you can engage with your favorite artist. At the end of the show, you can talk to them. And I think that's amazing. Even if you don't have a chance to talk to them, you can hear them speak to one of their friends, right? Because we all have the same question. So kudos to you. I love your platform. So congratulations on that. Um, I do Thank have you. some questions um, in terms of like the technical side as well, too. Can you integrate the Encore app with other platforms that are also available as well? Is it more of like a web AR type of a um, platform that the app is built on? So... Technically, the app is built, um, the underlying engine is Unity. Yeah. So, um, you know, very wide, deep uh, gaming, 3D gaming engine. Mm -hmm. And then it's all built on iOS. And so iOS provides AR kit and all this really cool AR stuff. Um, we have built a bunch of our own secret sauce into there. And that then goes into Unity as this like 3D rendering engine. We've really focused on how to make that as accessible to someone who has no experience in AR as possible. So, you know, the thing, I have a seven-year-old daughter. We've been building this app for about two years and she's always been one of the, you know, one of our lead testers, right? Mm -hmm. Her, you know, a, a six-year-old being able to pop open the app and to start making something has been a really important aspect of what we're doing because there's going to be like again we're all about accessibility like we're all about artists being able to do this themselves and artists are not necessarily like 3d designers they're not necessarily a software developer they may not be technical at all mm -hmm. but you shouldn't need to be technical to use our app and so I think, you know kind of all around we've really been focused on just usability and accessibility making it as simple as possible to use. And so one example of that is, you know, you can do full 3D rendering stuff inside of Unity, 
and our app supports 3D and we have a bunch of 3D assets and stuff like that that are already all preloaded inside of the Encore library. Yeah. When an artist wants to customize and put their own assets in, mm -hmm. um, they do that largely through 2D. So one of the ways that we've made AR and 3D AR more accessible is the ability to bring 2D images, animated GIFs, video, and things like that, which are things artists already have, but bring them into AR in a new way. And so, you know, as an example, like we, you can do anything with our app from just mixed reality. So I can be in this room and start adding things to it, or I can make an entire virtual world. And, you know, a lot of what's happened in the creative is, um, artists are just bringing their own stuff into the app now. And so they're taking their cover art or they're taking their logo or they're going on Google street view and taking the screenshot and trying to create a map of, you know, the way that, that a certain street corner looks like. Um, and so for us, it's all been about how in our app, someone pops open their phone can just start making stuff and can start making it theirs. Um, not have not focused a lot yet on kind of like AR portability into mm -hmm. other ecosystems and other tools like that. Um, we will get there. And I think, you know, that's a lot of how we will engage the existing AR creator community. Um, there's these really big AR ecosystems like Spark AR and mm -hmm. LensKit and all of that stuff from the big social companies. Um, we definitely want to have a really cool place for those AR creators. Mm -hmm. um, to participate and be part of the marketplace. Um, but so far, very focused around kind of not AR creators and how we can make something that is really usable and fun and customizable for them. Perfect. So it's just a lot more accessible for everybody to use, regardless of your background, right? That's amazing. And you had mentioned that in AR, um, you can provide different animated effects, such as fireworks off stage, changes of weather conditions, or you can you know have different stages. Does augmented reality affect resolution for display, and can you render more precisely at a higher definition? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean one of the biggest things for us in AR is um, we're all mobile. And so that definitely boxes us in to what kind of resolutions and rendering we can do. Um, you know, I think there's an entire world of like AR VR that is rendered server side on a bunch of GPUs <laughs> and is doing photorealism and a bunch of really dynamic lighting effects and HDR and all those kinds of stuff. Um, iPhones don't do that. Um, you're rendering in real time on a phone, you know, 30 or 60 times per second. Uh, it's pretty incredible that it works at all, honestly. Um, but I'd say one of the things also has been, you know, how the app gets used more and more is the 2D in 3D. So if you take, you know, let's say we have a Ferrari and I can go on the internet and find some really high resolution 3D Ferrari. Yeah. I can load that into my app. It will work in the app, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm rendering a 2 million polygon, you know, very, very detailed object, the phone will slow down. And if I want to have five of them, that may not work um, because you can't render all of that stuff at once on a phone. And so what, one of the kind of best practices that we have and that's been really interesting, and this is kind of what a lot of our shows start to look like is I can just take an image of a Ferrari yeah. and cut it out transparent, mm -hmm. throw that in. A lot of times it actually looks better. Yeah, um, I agree. Because it's just, it's, you're not trying to make a 3D model render to look real. You're taking a photo and just mm -hmm. looking at a photo. Yeah. And then you're actually not rendering all of those polygons anymore. And if I wanted a hundred of those cars, I can have them. Exactly. And so that's, what's been really interesting as we, you know, a lot of people when they think AR and they think metaverse and they're thinking all the stuff, they're thinking 3d renderings and very complicated types of scenes. And it's not that you can't do that, but I think that ultimately it's, it's, the more you start to become high production, the less accessible you are. Yep. 
right? There's, like you said, Roblox and, and um, Fortnite doing these really high level productions. There's other really cool companies out there, like a company called Wave. Yep. They do these really cool avatarized virtual um, concerts. Um, there's a room full of designers and 3D you know, software developers making that show a reality. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, ultimately what we see is you can spend a lot of time with making something look amazing and be super detailed and photorealistic. But this is really about the artist and them doing their things. And the visuals are there to tell a story, to create the right mood, to further engage the viewer into the experience of the artist. But it's exactly like you said before, you know, we do have a slightly different take on kind of metaverse and all of the stuff than I think, you know, people are taking sides <laughs> in some yeah. sense. And, you know, we're definitely on the side of, we really believe in AR. And I think when it comes to live music, for the most part, fans want to see the artist. Right. And um, the connection that comes, you know, one of the things that's really cool about the app is it's portrait. People are doing the shows from phones. And so you see the artist really up close and personal and they're singing, rapping, doing their thing. And if they're incredibly talented and they have this great charismatic energy and they're engaging, it just pours right through. And does it matter that, you know, they spent $200 on a high resolution Ferrari 3D modeled in the background? Doesn't matter, right? right? What really matters is the energy the exchange, the everything about that actual live experience, and then how you use visuals to make that better. But ultimately, they're not there to replace the artist. They're not there to be the point. They're there to really be in support of the artist. Okay. Uh, do you feel that with the pandemic, um, there's been a shift in the mu- music industry? And with the recent interest in the metaverse, will this pump new life into the music industry in itself? Yeah, I mean, the music industry is actually in an amazing spot right now. You know, I think um, there's a lot of opportunity in music. Um, The music industry, I talk about on a daily basis, how undersized it is. There's a really good example this week um, with the Microsoft's um, acquisition of Activision. What was the number? 70 70 billion dollars. 70 bill, okay. $70 $70 billion, that's the acquisition price. It is more than the combined market caps of the two biggest record labels. I know, I know. That's okay, crazy. so in the music world, UMG is the behemoth. It's, mm-hmm. it's, like, it's less than 50% the acquisition price of one of, the, one of the major gaming companies out there that just got bought by a $2 trillion major, mega tech company. Yep. And so one thing that's so interesting about the world right now is that the mega tech companies have all this power gaming is humongous and music is a lot smaller except if you look at gaming and then if you look at social and these big platforms music is permeating them the biggest stuff that happened in the gaming platforms has been the music activations like the biggest rise in social like TikTok and all this stuff is off the back of music Mm -hmm. and um and so it's really interesting because music is actually there's more people listening to more music in the past five years than prior. So somehow something that's been around forever and everyone listens to, it's actually more of it. Um, There's more of it permeating social. There's more of it permeating gaming, like Peloton off the back of music, right? All of these different things, like music is at the center of them, but the music industry is 9.99 a month for all music. That's the business model of the music industry. And and so I I think over the next five years, you're gonna see a tremendous amount of experimentation, innovation, um, all different types of stuff around music. Um, you know, you can't talk about music without talking about rights and exactly. how people can exactly actually get that. paid for this. And I yeah. think that, you know, that's a lot of the, the what's going to get reconciled over the next five years is there's been a lot of pull and music is being brought into all of these places, but mm-hmm. a lot of that money is not flowing back. Exactly. That was actually and, my next question, right? With big opportunity comes big big challenges as well, too. So, you know, like there's um, 
with ex expansion with the music industry um, also presents new challenges, especially in terms of, of ownership and royalties. So the issues around copyright infringement, how are they going to deal with this? Like, do you know, like, what are the steps that they can possibly take? Or is there's like... <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's multiple, there's multiple layers of it. You know, one of the issues in music and music rights is it's hard. Mm -hmm. So even if you want to do the right thing, that's hard. Yeah. And I think that needs to be made easy. That's an industry level issue. I think it is going to get resolved maybe this year. But it's Hopefully. it's it doesn't make sense that mm -hmm. TikTok has to negotiate a bunch of different deals and then Triller has to negotiate a bunch of deals and then you know, if every company is one off negotiating contracts with all of the different labels and all the different publishers and all the different stuff, like that's clearly not scalable. Mm -hmm. Right. And it just, it's ripe with deal making and that's not how it should be. Right. Exactly. The rules of the road should just be set and everyone should be playing by those rules. Exactly. Um, and I think, so that's a huge kind of thing that prevents like, because it's not easy, therefore people cheat it people skirt around it, you know, it, even if you want to do the right things, you can't always do the right things. And so I think the, the legal side of the entire thing makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, technology is going to continue to get better. Like yeah. if you go and upload a track to YouTube, they've gotten quite good at detecting copyrighted stuff and, um, and taking that down and acting on it, or even better, just paying out the people who actually created the content. You know, I think YouTube has done some of the most interesting stuff in and around this. Um, but, you know, what's going to be really interesting, too, is just there's there's a lot of um, independent artists and there's going to be a lot more independent artists. And um, how are they keeping track of all this stuff? There's a lot of stuff, you know, it's also not easy for an artist who, you know, is using beats from this producer and wants to use a sample from this thing and Mm -hmm. Artists have a lot of music and they can't get it out because they don't have all the clearances to get it out. And all of this stuff just creates a very confusing landscape yeah. um, that, in my opinion, needs to be simplified so that things can just move a lot faster. And I, I, think, I, think, I think we're nearing that. Yeah, the problem is technology moves faster than the law right For that's sure. the issue we have like new products coming out new you know like services all the time but it's the legal aspect that's quite slow right they, I, and i don't know if that'll ever change but hopefully especially in the music industry because it's important um i have one last question um do you have any more features coming out on the encore app are you guys planning on adding maybe a marketplace where you know fans can buy merchandise is that a possibility or any are there any other features that you're looking into yeah, we've got tons of stuff coming. The big thing for us is, um, so the Encore app, it's really two apps. There's the Encore app, which is how you watch shows and engage with artists and and interact. Um, the studio app is how you actually produce shows, live stream, create this content, do the productions. The studio app has been in private beta. In the beginning of Feb, uh, it launches publicly. So mm -hmm. starting in February, anyone will be able to download the Encore Studio app. Anyone will be able to start building AR and doing their own custom stuff. And then um, artists will be able to live stream. And so right. it'll be an open app in February and um, just bringing on a lot more people. And then anyone who's interested and wants to just play and try it out and make content um, are, is going to be able to do that. So that'll be a very big and exciting time for us here um, as we put this into the hands of way more artists. Nice. So uh, what's your, your outreach? Um, you guys aren't doing a lot of marketing and advertising that, that I see. So Hari, is it mostly like a small community engagement? Is it word of mouth? Like how is the word spreading for Encore mostly? Yeah. So in February, you'll see a lot more public stuff okay. about us. And, you know, right now, because the artist production side of it is not publicly available, you know, we're a little bit more limited in how much we have marketed that side of it. Um, I'd say what we've been very focused on to date, and that all shifts right now, but to date, we've been very focused on working very directly with artists to understand, you know, first of all, there's a lot of creator platforms out there. 
there's Patreon and there's Twitch and there's all of these other, how come they're not using them? Or if they did, like what's wrong with them? Really understanding of the solutions that exist in the market. Why are they not being adopted widely? Um, and then, you know, testing a really important hypothesis of the company, which is, you know, we're, we're essentially building on the back of a belief that we have now validated that if we can convince artists to mm -hmm. create live shows on our app, that some number of their fans will download Encore and go to the show. Those fans will engage and clap and enjoy their backstage pass and, right? And so we've been very focused on doing that through 2021. Um, we've worked with over hundred artists. We've done tons of shows. And, um, but in all of those cases, we were in a private beta. Yeah. And so really what we were testing was, and actually when you get the Encore app today, you still need a code. And so what we've been testing is just that core kind of thesis of if an artist does a show, are they going to show up? <laughs> are the fans going to come? Are they going to download the app? What's it going to be like? And, you know, the great news is that's going awesome. We've really found artists that work great, you know, on our app that um, love AR, love doing these live shows, have their fans coming in and engaging. They're all exploding with ideas of what we should be building next and what they want to do next. Oh, nice. um, and so, yeah, we're really kind of under a big phase shift right now as, um, you know, moving away from us doing the shows and us working with artists directly and, and kind of building out our own artist community and now putting it out there and um, letting some of those communities grow yeah. uh, without us and, you know, with our help. And so we've also, you know, we've launched our Discord community and bringing the artists that we have and different AR creators in and around the Encore community to help um, get them off the ground. Mm -hmm. But that'll be an exciting time and you'll hear a lot more from us soon. I'm excited. <laughs> you, uh, definitely, you know, keep me in the loop for sure. Um, I'm definitely like looping you guys in for our inside XR newsletter as well. But um, I'm for out sure. of time. So thank you so much for chatting with me today. I'll throw it back to Stephanie to wrap everything up. Thank you so much. Did you make that announcement for the first time here, Jonathan, about the public creator app? I might have. <laughs> Exclusive. <laughs> I'm like, where's the like blimps announcing well, this we, right now? This is crazy. I know. Well, if we were if we were in the Encore Studio app, I could turn on confetti and flames. And, you know, we could do that, but that's what we need. <laughs> this is so exciting. Okay. So in February, it's not beta, any musician, any artist, any stand up comedic, they can download the creator app. What's it called? Studio? Encore it's called Encore Studio. Studio. Yep. And they can start performing and monetizing. Yeah. And anyone can just start building the, the kind of the, the barrier will be, you have to be, have a verified artist account to be able to actually live stream. Okay. But, um, but one of the things like anyone who's just interested in AR or just interested in playing around and creating content and like seeing what you're, what is possible on a phone today. Mm -hmm. um, Encore studio is a really good example of like how far you can push mobile technology right now. This is so interesting. I'm, I was so interested when you're talking about the scale of the music industry versus like gaming, you know, you and Gia were talking about the huge Microsoft acquisition. I did not realize that music was that small and it shouldn't be. And there's just this huge no gap sense. in the market. Yeah. It makes no sense. It's, it's, you know, the music industry is something like $25 billion, 30 billion. It just depends on how you want to size it and calculate it. The video game industry is over a hundred billion. And it shouldn't be right. that small. Exactly. There's nothing wrong with video games. Video games shouldn't be that big. Music right. shouldn't be so small. There's a lot right. of growth. There's a lot of growth to happen in the music industry. Um, okay. You're that, like. That, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm I know. About I feel like you have a, a because... crystal ball. <laughs> no, I don't. That's just the reality of the world today. Like, that is how it is right now. Those are just the facts. And I think to me, it's just something doesn't line up with the market caps of those companies and that much and how much value is there, you know? Right. Yeah. People so listen to music and music permeates everything and it's music is helping to launch all of these other types of things, but not participating in its success. So I'm like thinking about this gap in the market with the licensing that you and Gia were talking about and how hard it is to get 
rights to this beat and this sound and this person's bit and these this person's lyrics. Is there like going to be a company in the future that's just like a one-stop shop where every artist, big and small, like registers and every person that wants to make music and share it on the internet, like goes to get these rights? Is is there a need for something like that? There's, there's people trying to do that. There's, is there? I mean, the thing is, you know, that already exists in some ways. But they're just not but, one huge player. And it's also just in, in an old way. It's through centralized organizations that mm. you have to talk to. They're not through APIs, you know? And I think that's a little, it's a little bit of the mindset change that has to occur oh. to enable scale. It's like, okay. like literally when we want to clear rights for a song to put on our social media or something like that, because we're a live, we're a live app. And so licensing for live is completely different than licensing for recorded. Mm -hmm. If we take a live performance and record it and then want to put it on our social, you're in two completely different licensing camps. And these are different deals now, that you have to make with people. Yeah. So this is deals you make with performance rights organizations. Like you've heard of like ASCAP and BMI. Okay. So you got to pay them for this. But then if you want to put it on your social and you want to actually play back the track, you have to pay the, all of the rights holders. So you have to pay the record labels. You have to pay in addition to paying the publishers, songwriters, and all these other people. And if you want to do that, how much are you going to pay? It's ad hoc. Do you think it'll you be automated? negotiate how much you have to pay? Yeah. Like these negotiations are difficult. Like you said, a barrier. So, so what ends up typically happening is there's a lot of these one-off negotiations. And then if you become big enough, you will negotiate full deals with record companies. You'll negotiate the full deals with all of these types of things that do now kind of set a standardized set of terms. But those standardized terms are for you. And so right. these are all these one-off deals that are happening. Is it and possible for it to be automated? What do you think? It's inevitable. Okay. I think and it's, it's all gonna take it's gonna take techies, people that can, you know, people that are software engineers. This whole conversation has been so mind blowing about the music industry. But Jonathan, you are a software engineer. Yeah, um, I used to be. You used to be. <laughs> you don't <laughs> identify as a software engineer anymore. Okay. Oh no, I still, I still do, I still do. But yeah, I don't get to write that much software, unfortunately. I wish okay. I did. Well, like on this topic, you had so many tech startups in the past, and I feel like you had that crystal ball mentality when it came to tech. Like you had a company that was acquired by Google that was like data, and that was something they needed. Um, you even went to Facebook because you built something that they needed. Um, so I feel like this this instinct of knowing what's next and what's needed is translated now to the music industry with you. And you have this extreme passion for it that comes through. I mean, like, what's your future look like? I mean, you're like in the music industry in LA. I mean, tell me more about what you see for the future with your career, I guess. You know, I think um, I talked to a lot of founders. My favorite thing in the entire world is helping other founders through the oh, insanity yeah, of lab. doing doing your own startups and all those kinds yeah, of stuff. Yeah, you've and, got a startup lab. And so then for me, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, but everyone's always wondering like, how do I know when to start a company? And is this the right idea and blah, 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 blah. And like, for me, if you looked at the companies I've started, they've been very different. I did a social consumer one. I did a hardcore enterprise deep tech. This is obviously in the music industry, very consumer. You know, the reason I started each of the companies is because is all I could think about. Really? It's, it There was something that told me, if I don't do this, someone will. And I want it to be me. And I see something, it's going to happen. I want to make that happen. I want it to be me. I want to make that future exist. So it's like, once you believe in something, if you can't let it go, that means this is something good. And I think for me, you know, this company was a company I, I, I got into after saying I wouldn't do it. Like saying, really? I'm not going to do a founder CEO role right away. And I'm going to take time and just help other people and do my startup lab and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but what's really exciting about this one and, you know, answers the question of where I see my career going is just, I don't see anything past this right now. Mm. And, you know, I think the reason is that um, what's so exciting about what we're doing 
and so different from my other startups is we like literally change lives. So we don't get to save lives, but we do get to change lives. And getting kids paid is really, really awesome. Um, like talented, hardworking, on the hustle, on the grind, really creative, amazing artistic kids. Get them paid? Who, they can pay rent now. They get to be musicians. Like the more people who we would get to be able to have a living being music artists. And, you know, one of the most exciting things that I said really at the beginning of this company is like, we can incentivize artists to create more art. Instagram has no incentives to do good stuff. The incentives is to create meme, throwaway viral content, not new art. And, and to that's what's partner, so exciting. To partner with like companies and get sponsors and sell stuff that's not your art. And what you're doing yeah. is like art for art's sake. Yes, exactly. And, you know, our whole thing is like, we talk about Taylor Swift and, you know, she had this great op-ed when Apple Music tried to give away her music for free. Mm -hmm. And she said, you can't give away my music for free. Like music is art. Art has value. Valuable things cost money. And I think that's part of the reason that the music industry is so small is that there is just a concept that music's free mm -hmm. and it ain't. And I think that that's really what is a big shift. I think it's happening all over the place. This is not it's, just yeah, music. It's happening that's with why, visual art and NFTs. Yeah. yeah exactly. That's why NFTs, it's like everyone on the creative side is like, oh my God, like value I creation, don't, wealth creation. Yeah. Like I don't have to just create this paid. digital art that's like for Procter & Gamble's product right. or something, you know, <laughs> like I can create this digital art and it can be beautiful and change lives and, and be paid on the merit of that. Makes so sense. that's what we're going after. And, <laughs> you know, I think uh, that's that's what like is so exciting about the company now is that we, you know, kids are getting paid and the artists that we've worked with that have had really good success, like continuously want to keep coming back. And yeah. um, and that's going to so be the public next. That That's the really fun part. And it's hard that's to imagine happen. that getting old, I guess. Yeah. And so it's. it's less of a company that I have to think too much about what's next or after it because the journey itself is super fun and, um, you know, get to actually work with. And another thing is like for all of the insanity of super famous people and music stars and all that stuff, the artists that we're working with and artists in general are by and large amazing to work with. That's awesome. And that's really fun. Your path, your switch from, you know, you're still in tech, but tech into this really music industry, uh, you know, app that you've got going on. This is like my last question because we're almost out of time, but you dove into the music industry head first. And I'm sure there were lots of um, aha moments that brought you there. But can you talk a little bit about like how you got in this space and how you knew this was the next big thing and couldn't stop thinking about it? And you're like, I have to demo help democratize the music industry with this company. Yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of like the journey we just went on a little bit, which is the more you learn about music, the more you're scratching your head and wondering why it's that way. Oh. And, you know, I think like every good disruptive story, it, a lot of times you have to have someone who's coming at it from the outside with completely fresh eyes saying like, yeah. why on earth is this this way? And, you know, for me, like my entire life has been defined by music, but never professionally. Mm. And, and so that's what's really exciting about the company is to be able to bring lifelong passion into the fold of what I get to do for work. But I mean, from March, you know, 2020, which was when COVID hit and mm -hmm. I was actually helping Encore. Ian was a sole, solo founder. Oh, wow. And I met him a year before COVID. I was helping him with the idea and getting it off the ground and helping him figure out what the product was going to be and help raise some money. And then when COVID hit, I was like, this is super timely. All totally. of the things we've been talking about are going to be very mm -hmm. front and center and of attention. And more importantly, like 
artists are going to be doing live streaming from their phones all of the time. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a norm now. And so it's, that's, that's, we should do this. And that led to a two month deep dive into the music industry for me, which oh, okay. was, there's a great book, everything you need to know about the music industry. <laughs> this, it's, th it's this thick. Oh, wow. And, but <laughs> and it's a it, book. Goes, it goes into tremendous detail about licensing and rights and how all of this stuff works. And that, that's a really important part. And then the other part for me was just talking to a lot of people in the music industry, talking mm -hmm. to Cuddy, talking to a bunch of managers, talking to the agencies, talking to labels, um, talking to producers, all these people in and around the music industry and pitching them what we were gonna do. And our ability to differentiate right away, our ability to kind of describe this new medium that didn't exist. Yep. And it just resonated with everyone. It was like, yes, this is great. And wow. so for me, it was really understanding the music industry, being very confused, and thinking that, you know, this is something that's going to undergo change. Talking to everyone in the music industry who would be like, yeah, that's right. So it was a really good gut check with the industry. Um, and then the last thing is just like, now is the right time to do things in music and tech. Every other era before this, music and technology were fighting each other. Mm. And it's totally different now. Um, now that the whole streaming thing is done and that has been reconciled with the music industry, the music industry doesn't have a negative view of technology anymore. It's wow. all about, it's, it's all about that is the future, right? Mm -hmm. That is where the next big pots of gold are going to come from in the music industry. It's going to be from tech. Yeah. And so they're looking for the next big things. They're looking for how like TikTok has been great for the music industry. They've not figured out how to fully monetize it, but it's good for the music industry. Still and, moving forward. Um, and so, yeah, it's an exciting time to be in and around music and tech. And I think for 25 years, it's kind of been like a, a really tough place to be, but it's a lot more friendly now. Yeah, it sounds like it is so early for all this. I mean, our goal at inside.com is to be early to talk with people like you and hear about these things that really are going to be present in the future. Um, before I wrap it up, what's your genre? You said music is a huge part of your life. Hip hop. Really? Yeah, I mean, and, go and on the app. The, you'll, you'll I mean, see. I, I want to I wanna, like ask what the origin story was, but you're from Cali, aren't you? So I'm from West Cali. I'm from Los Angeles. Okay. And gotcha. yes, Say no and more. <laughs> I, I have a brother who's eight years older than me. And so when okay. I was a very, very little kid, I was listening to very inappropriate music. And um, But still, no wonder it's such a passion of yours. Yes, I've been obsessed. And yes, I was a DJ. I played four instruments. I was obsessive with music and, um, and never considered working at all in anything related to music. So we it's are. been really, really <laughs> fun and exciting. That's awesome. Um, where can yeah. the audience go to learn more about you and about Encore? Yeah, come to our website, our socials, clap for Encore, mm -hmm. um, or go to the App Store and type in Encore and mm -hmm. you'll find us. This is our icon. <laughs> I know just the word Encore is out there a lot, but clap for Encore, you know, on the web and yes. then just type in Encore to the App Store to get the app. Cool. Yep. And this talk here, we're going to have a, a video replay link of it in our XR newsletter tomorrow. Um, if anyone listening hasn't signed up for that newsletter, it's inside.com slash XR. It's your daily dose of present and future of immersive technology. And I think, Jonathan, you really helped us see the future here in our talk today. So thank you so much for all this great knowledge and innovation and for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's really fun.